Some 50,000 years ago, the woolly mammoth had a holarctic distribution, ranging from Spain through Asia and into North America, all the way to the Great Lakes region. But around 12,000 years ago, the population began to dramatically decline, as many places became climatically unsuitable for them, and human migration through the whole Arctic dramatically cut recruitment, as younger mammoths were specifically targeted by early human hunters. And mammoths were completely wiped out from Eurasia and North America around 9,600 years ago. However, there was still a secret place where mammoths thrived. A large island 140 kilometers north of the Siberian coast out in the Arctic Ocean, Wrangell Island. Humans seem to have not reached this remote place and so somewhere between 300 to 1,000 mammoths lived more or less in peace. But around 4,000 years ago, as the Egyptians were busy building the Great Pyramid, the last of the world's woolly mammoths died. But why? They had seemingly been doing okay on this spit of land for thousands of years prior. To understand why the mammoths on Wrangell Island died out, we have to understand how species and populations ultimately go extinct, which can be explained with a special class of mathematical models called the extinction vortices or extinction spirals, which during the course of this video, I hope to explain. There are four recognized vortices, the A vortex, the R vortex, the F vortex, and the D vortex. Basically, populations decline when the death or emigration rate is higher than the birth or immigration rate. What the extinction vortex shows is how the decline of a species becomes a positive feedback loop where the effects of a declining population leads to the population becoming smaller and smaller and having less of a chance of recovering. The use of the term vortex or spiral comes from the idea that the feedback loop causes the population to decline more and more rapidly as it becomes smaller. It was being trapped in a F vortex that likely did in the mammoths on Wrangell Island. When sea levels rose as the ice age came to an end, a very small population of mammoths were isolated on the island. Due to their large distribution in the northern hemisphere, mammoths on the continents were likely to breed with unrelated individuals with genes flowing between Europe, Asia, and North America. This kept deleterious traits from presenting themselves. Analysis of the Wrangell Island mammoth's DNA shows that they had many genetic defects, with many important genes regulating proteins and even their sense of smell had become non-functional. Beyond this, the mutations led the mammoths to express a shinier satin coat than the older continental populations of mammoths. This was a direct result of the population arising from a few individuals in a genetic bottleneck, forcing related mammoths to breed together leading to homozygosity through inbreeding and genetic drift, which is a slightly confusing concept, where random chance makes it so particular genes may or may not be passed from a parent into their offspring. In large populations, this is not much of an issue, as there are enough individuals in the population that genes lost in one generation could be reintroduced into a later one. However, in small populations, the loss of genetic diversity tends to compound in a positive feedback loop, and slowly the population drifts towards all of them having the same genetic traits. Once all members of a population have the same alleles, the trait becomes fixed and cannot be undone without a large number of unrelated organisms coming in. The problem is that since it is random, alleles that are not advantageous for survival of a species might be fixed and drag the whole population to extinction. And around 3,700 years ago, the mammoths suddenly went extinct. Which is where people start to argue about what happened. The oldest records of people on the island occur a little over a hundred years later, so some argue humans killed the last mammoths. Others suggest a disease or some climate anomaly. But the most recent work suggests that it was all related to the F vortex. After 5,000 years of isolation, so many deleterious traits built up that the population experienced what is called genetic meltdown, and was quickly sucked into the extinction vortex. Today, hunting of large animals like rhinos, elephants, and tigers, or the collection of animals for food or for the pet trade, can result in similar genetic issues arising, 
which is why maintaining genetic diversity in these animals is critical for ensuring their future. The A vortex has to do when a small population breeds with members from a genetically different population or group. The resulting hybrids are less fit to survive than the parent, and so ultimately the population collapses into the extinction vortex. There are two main reasons for the hybrids being less fit. First, the two parents might be so genetically different the offspring is sterile or has reduced fertility, so have issues passing on genes, or some important genes will be fine in the first hybrid generation because they retain complete versions from the two parents, but they become incomplete in the next generation, resulting in declining fitness. And second, the two parents might be adapted for different conditions, and the hybrid will end up maladapted to conditions in the ecosystem. The spiral is the feedback loop of the population declining and becoming more likely to interbreed due to a lack of mates from their own population. On the South Island of New Zealand lives one of the world's rarest birds, the black stilt. It is one of a whole set of closely related shorebirds that has completely black plumage, likely to help it absorb heat to survive along the shores of the frigid glacier-fed lakes and streams that it lives near. Over the last few hundred years or so, it has declined dramatically due to introduced predators and habitat loss as the result of human development along rivers. The real issue for its future survival, however, is that in the early 19th century, a different stilt species naturally arrived in New Zealand. Black stilts have a preference for the darkest colored mates, but they are so rare that some birds have no choice but to pair up with the other species, which results in hybrids. These hybrids seem to have reduced fitness and produce fewer offspring than non-hybrids. The preference for darker colored mates does suggest if the black stilt population could be made large enough, just maybe the species can escape its A vortex. But we will have to see. In the case of a R vortex, an environmental disturbance leads to the population being sort of thrown out of whack with changes in the demographics of the population, such as skewed sex ratios or fewer offspring being born, leading to the population declining. Probably one of the best examples I could think of is how climate change affects sea turtles. So, the planet is warming, and the sex of a baby turtle is determined by temperature of the sand surrounding it during development. If conditions are warmer, the eggs are more likely to develop into females, and if the beach is cooler, males are more likely to develop. So logic would suggest that as the climate warms, more female turtles are hatching, and research backs this up. In Australia, research has found that generally turtle sex ratios are slightly female biased. But over the past few decades, they have become extremely female biased, with over 99% of hatchlings in some areas being female. This skewed sex ratio means the effective population size becomes quite small. The effective population size basically gives us an idea of genetically how many individuals we see if the population was a typical 50-50 sex ratio. So, in a population with a 50-50 sex ratio, the entire population generally counts. But when the population becomes skewed, we get the potential for some inbreeding, which means more individuals are genetically similar, and so genetically gives the impression of fewer individuals. So, since this technically is a math video, let's do a little math to illustrate what the effective population of 1,000 turtles in one of these skewed populations, with 99% being female. So, the effective population size equals 4 times the number of females times the number of males divided by the number of females plus the number of males. So even though male sea turtles can breed with multiple females, the effective population size is only about 40 turtles. This is not a very large population, and the whole population could collapse in a few hundred years or so. The D vortex is perhaps the most common kind of extinction vortex that humans actively cause. This is where a disturbance breaks a population into many smaller populations over a geographic area that are then more likely to go extinct, which causes the remaining populations to be even more isolated and in turn more likely to go extinct. This is the classical kind of extinction we see with habitat fragmentation, where a series of local extirpations ultimately result in the entire species disappearing as areas become too small for breeding populations to persist, 
or too far apart for genetic flow to maintain genetic diversity between the different populations through immigration and the rescue effect. So those are the four different extinction vortices. While in this video I have them separated, in reality the different vortices often occur simultaneously or feed into each other, with pretty much all small populations experiencing a F vortex, but may also be dealing with another vortex or the initial shrinking of the population will be due to a different vortex, which then feeds into an A or F vortex which drives the population to extinction. What, you thought it would be simple? Nature is complicated. Anyway, I hope I did a good job of explaining what extinction vortices are and how they lead populations to become extinct. I have many videos on this channel dedicated to the stories of extinct species, and if you're interested in the topic, I recommend my video essay on the extinction of the golden toad. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out once a month. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you will be reminded when the next episode in this series comes out.